This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. It's now a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, a close colleague of arts and a man that shares uh, tenacity with art and that the whole name of this game is to understand what we can do and make that the standard, make that the mandatory program, but look out at what we must do and bring that in so that that is the new standard and that is the next objective. Uh, I'm reminded, uh, I was reminded recently of a quote uh, attributed to Winston Churchill, which is, sometimes uh, doing your best is not enough Sometimes you must do what is required. And I think at this point in time, climate change needs its Winston Churchill, and I think that might be Mike Peavy. Well, thank you very much, Dan. But uh, the, the, the British phrase that I like even better than one that he just gave from Winston Churchill is one from the Special Air Service. It's only three words. It says, who dares wins? I think that has more zip. Art, it's a pleasure to be out here and to uh, uh, speak about you and to you. I have to say, I, I'm not going to flash it back up there, but he had that wonderful uh, PowerPoint of Washington, D.C. And what I noticed was not only was the Department of Energy's roof not white, which is a hell of an indictment in and of itself, one would think, wouldn't it? Uh, but Every building, the Cannon, the Longworth, and the Rayburn House buildings were also dark. Green. Green. And I'm saying to myself, is this just another example of Washington, D.C., the difference between reality on the one hand and promise on the other hand? Uh, and I certainly hope not. I went on the Public Utilities Commission in March of 2002. And, of course, I got the usual uh, several phone calls uh, congratulating me, one of them from a commissioner who said, it's great to have you coming on the PUC and all. And one of those calls, the first calls I got, was from this guy named Art Rosenfeld at the Energy Commission. Now, I knew of Art, but I didn't know Art in a personal sense. And Art called me up and he said, Mr. Peavy, and I said, yes. He said, this is Art Rosenfeld at the CEC. And I said, yes, nice to hear your voice. And he said, you know, I understand you have a real interest in energy efficiency. I mean, he's a hell of a salesman, you know? <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's kind of true. I do, as a matter of fact. And he said, well, I'd like to sit down and meet with you. Your agency isn't doing a darn thing about energy efficiency. Now, I'll spare talking about my predecessor as president, but the fact was that not a heck of a lot was going on. And so I, would, I, I as a commissioner, I inherited the staff of the previous commissioner who had, who had uh, left the position uh, in it toward the end of his term, and I asked my staff, a uh, couple of, them of whom are here today, and uh, is that true? And they said yes and that we wanted to do something on energy efficiency, have what we call an OIR, order instituting rules and regulations and so forth, on, on this. But it, there was, it was just meeting a lot of opposition, and is there something you could do about it? So I did. I met with Art, and we got something going at the PUC. We got a lot going, and it's gone on ever since that time. And it was Art and myself and the then a person that was heading up the California Power Authority, Sonny McPeak, who first I remember sitting in a hearing room at the PUC and going over the rules and the, and, and the procedures we would follow to get this going on energy efficiency again. You remember that? That was 2002. So it's, uh, it's been a while. And I sat here most of this day, and the one thing I didn't hear was how far California has come in those eight years. And we'd come quite a ways, but it was spasmodic before that. that since then, there's been a very steady policy uh, 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 toward energy efficiency program, program, program after program. And it was all enshrined 
in the Energy Action Plan we adopted the next year are agencies that said, for California, we have a loading order, which is simply a priority list, and energy efficiency is first, renewables are second, and then and, and, uh, just so on and so forth th thereafter. And that was adopted by the Energy Commission, the Public Utilities Commission, and then the Power Authority. And again, I said energy efficiency is first, and that has now become the common currency in this state. That wasn't the case in, in 2002 or 2003 or 2004. And when I see Chevron and others run ads today saying energy efficiency should be the number one objective, I say you know, that we have now become the conventional wisdom. And I think that's, I think that's very true. So, Art, so much is owed to you. You've heard it all day long. You'll hear it again and again. So I'm going to depart from talking about you for a minute and talk about the next speaker because I want to introduce someone who I hold very, very dear to me. I first met the governor's chief of staff, Susan Kennedy, in 2001. I got drafted by then-Governor Gray Davis to come to Sacramento to try to help in the energy crisis. And frankly, after getting in that office for a week and kind of getting the lay of the land, I was kind of appalled. It didn't seem to me that there was anybody willing to make decisions, tough decisions on a day-to-day -day basis you had to do, until I met the cabinet secretary, who was Susan Kennedy. And Susan uh, was, there was an, a, an attraction there. She, I'd go in and say something to her, and she said, what do you want me to do, PV? And I'd say, well, I think A and B. And she said, okay, we'll get it done. And that started a friendship. And then at the end of that year, she went on the Public Utilities Commission. And Susan was on the PUC for three years. And she said to me when she went on the PUC, you know, I really have a big interest in telecom and I want to see change in that industry. Technology's coming fast. We're way behind in regulation and so on and so forth. And it's an area that I want to spend much of my time in, but I also want to be involved in something meaningful in the energy area. And I said, well, what's that? She said, energy efficiency. And I said, oh, hell. I mean, that's what I want to do. <laughs> but I said, okay. And so she kind of took that, that chunk of our efforts and for three years, or three years at the PUC, ran with it on energy efficiency. Susan and myself and others went to Italy. Uh, during that period of time, we visited Italian utility Enel, which was putting in 30 million smart meters. And we came back to California and we said, what the hell's wrong with California? Here's the Italians putting in smart meters with IBM as the system coordinator and Echelon from San Jose producing a significant piece of it all. And so we got that program underway. Now, once in a while, you read about PG&E having some problems with the four and a half million meters that they put in. Apparently, a legislator or two thinks there's a little gnome inside the meter that keeps adjusting the numbers upward. Uh, even though General Electric and Landis and Gear are somewhat well known and have put in meters all over the world, including right here or in Sacramento right now. But we're go that program is going forward today. It's part of the whole smart grid, 18 million new meters in the state of California. Uh, we're, we're well down the road. Edison has put in over a couple million meters so far. That effort began during those years of 2003, 4, and 5 that Susan and I were working together. I remember. Diane Grunick talked about going to India and China with art. I remember Susan Kennedy going to China with art in 2004 or 5, signing an agreement with Jiangsu Province uh, to work collaboratively between that province and the state of California. Those are things that um, are memorable in California's push toward energy efficiency. Uh, and it's con constant harping and focusing on it. And we started at that time the conceptual thinking that has now become a uh, reality. Not only you've heard discussion the, this morning and, and this afternoon, but mostly this morning about decoupling, breaking the nexus between earnings and sales. That was done 20 plus years ago in California, 25 years ago, actually. We did, the, and that made the utilities indifferent 
as to sales so that there wasn't a, a, an, an economic reason why they'd be against energy efficiency. But in the last few years, we've taken the final step, imperfectly, but down, we're going down the road to allow them, the utilities, to earn money on their investments in energy efficiency so they have an economic incentive on energy efficiency equal to building new distribution, transmission, or power plants. And that's the right connection, it seems to me. And all these things have, have sprung out of the PUC, and many of them uh, started uh, with, with Susan Kennedy. So it is with particular pleasure and pride that I bring out and ask her to, to come out here and speak, my dear friend, my former colleague, continued colleague, the Governor's Chief of Staff, Ms. Susan Kennedy. Thank you so much. What's the, uh, the laptop stays here, huh? Well, it's a, it's a pleasure being here, Art. It's so good to see you again. You know, I had to really think about what I wanted to say. Uh, Sorry. Don't do that. I was told to come get it. Thank you. I had to really think about what I wanted to say. Be I mean, is it, is it in the way? Is that what you're telling me? Fine. Got it. I got it. I follow directions well. I, I really had to think about what I wanted to say here because I, I don't get out much these days. And uh, although I used to be able to just talk about this stuff off the cuff and wing it and all that, um, you know, I really wanted to, this is such an important issue to me and this is such an important man to, to, to all of us that I really wanted to think about kind of what I wanted to say. So I, I was a little bit of, there's a little bit of rambling in my thoughts, but um, Arthur Sackler once said that art and science are two sides of the same coin. Art is a passion pursued with discipline. Science is a discipline pursued with passion. So I was asking myself, what is energy efficiency? Is it a science, a discipline, a philosophy, a, a lifestyle? Why do we pursue energy efficiency? Why do we even care? We can't really have a conversation about the future of energy efficiency without exploring these questions. And if we want to reach anywhere near the potential that energy efficiency has to offer, we have to agree on what the answers are. Because I will bet you that there's not three people in this room, I know there's not three people in Sacramento who would have the same answers to the questions right now. And yet it's one of the most important policy issues that we deal with every single day at both the state and federal level of government. Let me throw out just a couple of thoughts. Energy efficiency, in some ways, is the search for perfection. It's the continual search for ways to produce the most energy from the least amount of energy, kind of like uh, the principle behind martial arts. People study martial arts because there's a value in its practice, self-defense, strength, health, enjoyment. People study energy efficiency be because there's also a value in it, reducing waste, saving money, technological innovation. But the value in energy efficiency is only there if other people practice it. In a, an article in uh, Science Magazine last year, journalist Dan Charles said, the biggest challenge with energy efficiency is not inventing new technologies, but persuading more people to adopt technology and practices that already exist. So uh, does that make energy efficiency a behavioral science? It's a, energy is a $100 billion industry in California. Tens of billions of dollars will be invested in energy, energy facilities this year alone. Our cutting edge standards on energy efficiency for buildings and appliances, uh, I'm sure this has been said 20,000 times today, have saved consumers and businesses more than $50 billion over the last three decades. You would think that this cash value alone should be enough to drive private sector investment in energy efficiency, and yet without the right combination of government mandates and incentives, it wouldn't have happened. Energy efficiency can save state government hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars a year in reduced energy costs and billions in environmental costs. And yet energy efficiency is one of the last things that state government agencies ever invest in. It can save consumers hundreds of dollars a year, a year but it's not something that consumers invest in without some kind of prompting. In fact, 
Even though California has led the nation in energy efficiency policies for decades, it wasn't until the California energy markets went awry 10 years ago that energy was viewed as a finite resource that needs to be managed and conserved. As damaging as the electricity crisis was for California in both political and economic terms, one good thing that came out of it was an awareness that electricity costs money, and saving electricity saves money, big money. The public conservation campaign under the umbrella of the Flexure Power and the 2020 program sa shaved three to 5,000 megawatts off peak electricity usage during the, the summer from hell, the summer of 2001, which was a remarkable feat that saved billions of dollars for consumers and prevented more than about 150 hours of blackouts. As much, of 30, as much as 30 percent of the energy savings that we instituted back then persist today because of our focused investment in energy efficient appliances, building standards, and a new public consciousness that energy is a valuable resource. You know, the Energy Commission would never have been able to break new ground last year with adoption of cutting edge energy standards for televisions were it not for the public support for aggressive energy efficiency and conservation policies that were born during the electricity crisis. This strong public support also laid the foundation for California to become a world leader in climate change policies that emphasize a shift to renewable energy supplies, energy efficiency, and smarter land use planning. These are all very controversial regulatory initiatives, and we have the, the, the public support to carry them out in part because of this new consciousness. We're way ahead of other states and the country as a whole in developing solar and wind resources, low carbon fuels, energy efficient technologies, in part because the fear and anger that, was, that is left over from the electricity crisis is fueling California's re relentless drive to invent our own future, a future that's not dependent on fossil fuels and can't be manipulated by another Enron. And the drive is, is paying off. California attracts 57% of the nation's venture capital in clean technologies. It was about $3.3 billion in 2008. Our research centers, our universities are the best in the world. Almost 1,500 new inventions were reported by, use, by researchers at UC campuses last year. UC has received more U.S. patents than any other university in the world. 47 startup companies were based on UC technology last year, double the number from five years ago. In fact, technology from, the, from UCLA alone produced as many startup companies last year than was generated from the entire UC system in 2005. California companies are designing the next generation of solar panels, algae-based fuels, fuel cells, zero energy homes that will literally save the world. The will, the capital, the know-how, it's all in California. What we don't have is a coherent integrated energy policy. At the state government level, we're flying by the seat of our pants. Our greatest policy work on energy efficiency, on renewable energy, on climate change is being done by the remarkable leadership of individuals on boards and commissions in departments and agencies and individual leaders like Governor Schwarzenegger. This document the California Long-Term Energy Efficiency Strategic Plan put out by the California Public Utilities Commission in September of 2008 is the only document by any agency that I could find in all of state government that lays out a strategic plan for implementing energy efficiency. A few months ago, the CPUC adopted a $3.1 billion energy efficiency program that Mike Peavy was just talking about for investor-owned utilities that represents the largest commitment ever made by any state to energy efficiency. Last year, the California Air Resources Board adopted the world's first comprehensive plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The very first action item in the scoping plan is expanding and strengthening ener existing energy efficiency programs. The Energy Commission, as I mentioned before, made international news recently by adopting the most stringent energy efficiency standards in the world for televisions. The Commission is also leading a path-breaking effort to, f to, to uh, facilitate renewable energy development in the California desert. It's called the Desert Renewable Ener Energy Conservation Plan. The DRECP is a multi-year, multi-agency, multi-government effort to identify renewable energy zones, habitat protection, and mitigation areas in the desert to facilitate solar, geothermal, and wind energy resources. This is part of a larger effort, a statewide effort called the Renewable Energy Transmission Initiative to do the same thing for transmission lines that can carry renewable energy. All of this is being done without any comprehensive policy directive at the state or federal level. 
In fact, it's a testament to the commitment and the moxie of leaders at the PUC, the CEC, the ISO, and the Air Board to move this critical agenda forward in spite of conflicting policies and bickering politicians at both the state and federal levels. There are more than a dozen overlapping agencies administering conflicting federal, state, and local statutes that regulate everything from energy efficiency to grid reliability to greenhouse gas emissions to renewable energy mandates, endangered species protection, air quality, and more and more. Imagine being the CEO of an investor-owned utility trying to navigate California's land regulatory landscape today on energy. The independent system operator, CalISO, requires d dispatchable power plants to be built in specific locations to support grid reliability. California's RPS statute requires 20 percent of our ele electricity come from renewable resources by 2010. The Air Resources Board regulations require 33 percent renewable by 2020. The California Solar Initiative calls for adding 3,000 megawatts of solar by the end of tw 2016. The Climate Change Scoping Plan calls for reducing electricity demand by 32,000 gigawatt hours by 2020. The Energy Action Plan uh, calls for, for uh, new electricity demand to be met by demand reduction, energy efficiency, renewable energy in that order. New residential construction in California must be zero net energy by 2020. All commercial construction must be zero net energy by 2030. Only new baseload generation with lower GHG emissions than new combined cycle natural gas, ga natural gas plants will be permitted, effectively eliminating it, uh, coal energy from in or out of state. Our regional air boards limit electricity generation facilities in air quality non-attainment areas, and getting air permits has been, has been very difficult. And the state water board is preparing to issue first-in-the-nation regulations requiring billions of dollars to retrofit or, or retire plants that use once-through cooling technologies. There are statutes and regulations requiring solar net metering for customers, community choice aggregation, distributed generation, combined heat and power, smart grid investment. And the RPS bill that was vetoed by the governor last year would have mandated a specific amount of renewable energy facilities be built in state versus out of state and would have limited which electrons could count towards the RPS goal based upon where and when they were delivered to California customer, customers. Some of these statutes and regulations are in direct conflict with one another. There is no single agency responsible for determining our energy needs, monitoring supply, prioritizing permits, or coordinating regulations. It's a miracle that we've gotten anything at all accomplished, <laughs> let alone kept the lights on and somehow managed to stay a world leader in renewable energy, climate change, and energy efficiency. It is only because of the unequaled leadership of people like Mike Peavy, Ralph Cavana, Yakut Mansour, Mary Nichols has stepped up and into the void. The authors, the policy wonks, and the technical warriors are today's groundbreaking policies. Diane Grunick, Karen Douglas, John White, James Goldstein, these are the people that do the work every single day without the benefit of any kind of a, of a, of a, of a game plan at the state level. And it, all of us are standing on the shoulders of legendary national leaders like Art Rosenfeld, Byron Scher, Fran, Fran Pavley. I'm sure I, I'm not even scratching the surface in terms of uh, you know, some of the, our, our greatest leaders. But it is. My, my point is that th this has all been done because people stepped into the void at this critical time in, it, it, throughout California history. We've stepped into the void without any statewide plan, without any the benefit of any kind of a, of a cohesive, integrated policy plan that prevents the conflicts from slowing us down. Governor Schwarzenegger proposed combining California's myriad energy departments into a cabinet-level agency with responsibility for, for planning our energy needs, coordinating the various policies, and facilitating permits. It's not as glamorous as climate change or Bloom Energy's mystery fuel cells, but it is one of our most important policy initiatives, and I'll tell you why. When I was on Governor Gray Davis' staff in the winter of 1999, I remember being warned that California might experience rolling blackouts because our available electricity supply could be outstripped by demands of the hot summer that was coming up. This was so foreign a concept that we could not see the threat as real. Undeveloped countries had rolling blackouts, not major U.S. cities, and not, certainly not California. Electricity was universally available, reliable, cheap. It was just there when you flipped a switch. The full force of the crisis hit us like a tornado, because at the time, no one knew about Enron's market games or why ma major power plants were suddenly in need of unplanned maintenance, right when the summer demand was beginning to skyrocket. And literally, overnight, California became a third world country, rationing electricity and struggling to keep the lights on. The single most important lesson we learned from that crisis is that energy is a resource that must be planned, 
managed, and developed. The transition of California's energy markets during, during deregulation took place right when a new governor began his administration. No one in Sacramento was even thinking about electricity supply or deregulation. No one noticed that we hadn't built a major power plant in more than a decade and that demand was starting to outstrip supply. By the time the blackouts hit, there was nothing Sacramento could do. Now, we came out of the energy crisis stronger than before, more committed, and our leadership today is unquestioned. Imagine what we could accomplish today if we didn't have the most dysfunctional governance system on the history of the planet. <laughs> imagine what potential, imagine what potential could be achieved if we coordinated our policies and dedicated California's massive resources towards achieving a set of clearly defined goals. Imagine what could be achieved if our nation had a clear and unflinching policy and set, a set of goals for renewable energy, climate change, a transmission system designed for tomorrow's energy market, smart grid technologies. The next generation of energy efficiency is not about new technologies, it's not about demand side management, it's about policy. And that's where we need to focus. That's, where they, that's how we're going to reach the full potential of this issue. I am so proud to have served with Art Rosenfeld at this time in our history. I'm grateful for the opportunity. I thank you for everything you have done. You are a, a giant, you're a hero, and you are a great human being. So I thank you very much. Do you have a slide in there? Yeah. Thank you very much, Susan. Bringing together 400 people is an extraordinary task, especially when most of you, in fact all of you, are really the energy efficiency elite. And you don't come together very easily. And it's a tribute to the staff of the Energy Efficiency Center, University of California, and a lot of other people that managed to get you all here and uh, listen and speak and participate, and so I'm very grateful to all of you for doing that. Now, I also have a couple housekeeping items, but I think I need a clarification before I go any further. Uh, John Kumi talked about the fact that uh, we, have to, um, we have to retire. I, I didn't keep count of how many Rosenfelds in order to meet the, uh, our climate goals. And I, I think it's really important to draw a distinction right now. While we are retiring a heck of a lot of Rosenfelds, we're not retiring art. And so with that, I want to thank you again. And I'll see you outside. Please return your uh, badges, because those are going to be recycled. Thank you, and good evening. <laughs>